Well, hooray and hallelujah. Welcome to another beautiful day in captivity. This is June 19th. We're recording this, otherwise known as Juneteenth. Happy end of slavery day, everybody. Hooray. Uh, my mother and I are still going for two walks every day. It's probably the most healthy thing for our brain. We, we do a walk in the morning and then we walk in the, in the early evening before the sun goes down. And in the park across the street, uh, today when we were walking, there was a Juneteenth um, protest. It looked like it was kind of cool. There's this, I call it the Peruvian corner of the park because it's a amphitheater that has like terraced seating. And uh, I call it the Peruvian corner because when I went to Peru, my favorite thing was how they did the terrace farming all over mountains everywhere in Peru are these, these beautiful terraces like you see, um, you know, rice paddies built or, or rice terraces built into mountains in Asia. And the Incas did that thousands of years ago. So at the Peruvian corner of Pan Pacific Park, they had a Juneteenth um celebration uh, slash protest and uh, the people just marched down Beverly Boulevard so uh, you might hear the occasional helicopter circling overhead it's been a lot less helicopters and sirens in the last week or so wouldn't you say mom a lot more peaceful yes a lot more peaceful and um, uh, you know it's this apartment where I'm living, I have a feeling that my landlord is going to raise the rent because I've had such a great view of history. I mean, you know, we just had to, you know, we were in the park, saw it happening. And then when we came back and we were eating lunch just now, uh, we could hear the people marching down Beverly Boulevard and yes. we run out on the balcony and we and, can see the people with yes. the signs. I mean, it's pretty exciting. They had drums and music. You lived in Washington, D.C. in 1968. Do you remember all the protests and things that were happening? I was not involved. It it was more like the news would have it every week. But did you ever see people marching down? No. No. It was just Uh, on the news and uh, stuff. Yes, in the news. Okay, cool. Well, and the other big news, um, my mother and I, we've been playing Scrabble, and my mom made a joke the other day. She said... um, you know, we need a little trophy so we could slide it back and forth across the table for whoever wins. So I jumped on Amazon and I looked up Scrabble trophies and I bought, and you can have them uh, engraved in whatever you want on the nameplate. So I had it put on the nameplate, Mom and Tom Scrabble Champion. And it's, it arri- a, <clears throat> it's arri- a nicer uh, trophy than I thought it would be. Uh, it's really nice. It's beautiful. It's got a star on the top that says Scrabble. It's got a blue base, my favorite color blue. It might be 12 inches tall. Yeah, and Mom and Tom Scrabble champion. (laughs) That is so cool. (laughs) And um, it arrived two days ago, and then yesterday we played, and my mom, you beat me 202 to 198. Yes, it was. And uh, you beat me soundly. (laughs) Well... Uh, you were winning. Uh, I was winning the whole game. Yeah. <laughs> Until the end. You, I did what you normally Your last do. four moves crushed me. You played uh, Zap for like... Oh, it was a It was triple. a triple word, yes. which was like uh, 34 points or something. <laughs> something or 35. Ridiculous. So ridi- ridiculous. Yeah, that's and what then, you uh, And then And then you played Blinker. <laughs> And uh, and I I was I was trying as hard as I could, and you your last four moves crushed me like a bug, and the, and the photo you... that I took of you <laughs> holding this Scrabble champion trophy, yeah. you have such a magnificent magnificent smile on your face. It was worth the twenty six dollars that I paid for this trophy. Oh, I I was glad to beat you. <laughs> You're a champion, Mom. Well, thanks. It won't be on my corner very long. <laughs> <laughs> I think you figured out all, all the best tricks. Oh, well, uh, we practice because we play every day. And uh, <clears throat> uh, normally, I'll be winning the whole first half, and then you come back <laughs> with all these words with QI and the, um, the Vs and, and the Zs, which are kind of hard. 
but uh, this time I beat you. Yeah, and you've and learned square. to look for the points when yeah. you're playing, and it's uh, you. You. Yeah, I've got all your tricks now. You've learned all my tricks. You are a <laughs> Scrabble master. You still and, beat me a lot more than I've beat you. But you're a, you're a champion, mom. No matter what the outcome of the game is. <laughs> well, it's coming along. <laughs> <laughs> so we've had a, um, a, a, a another great week. Um, we watched a couple of movies, old classics, because I was watching movies that were way too um, artsy for me, violent or artsy, <laughs> or uh, you know had uh, uncomfortable sexual scenes in it. Um, so we went with a, a couple of really innocent movies this week. One of my favorite movies of all time. It's a cheesy baseball movie with Robert Redford. It's called The Natural. Oh, I didn't think it was cheesy. <clears throat> well, I mean, there's, there's just like, it's. You know, the uh, Joseph Campbell wrote this book. It's called A Hero with a Thousand Faces. Mm. And he studied Greek mythology, religions, uh, theater, all contemporary cinema. And anyone we ever considered a hero never went straight up to the top. Anyone we ever considered a hero was on the way up and then got knocked down and had to overcome something. Uh, like Jesus had to overcome death. And then he's the greatest hero of all time. And so, like, he's the, it, it's it's the classic hero formula in the natural, where he was going to be this great star, and this woman shoots him, and then he's like, he's an old man when he comes back, and nobody wants him, but then um, he just starts crushing home runs, and the thing that's cheesy, like, he hits the home run and. All the lights explode. Oh, yeah, that was... And he, uh, he's running the bases. I, I love that movie anyway. I, I've yeah. seen that movie a hundred times. Yeah. I guess I kind of miss baseball because it's summer. Yeah. But uh, one of my favorite scenes in the... Oh, so so in the beginning, he's 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 from... He's from, I forget what state, but it, he's like... Midwest. Somewhere, somewhere in the Midwest. <clears throat> his father's a farmer. Lightning hits the tree. Or no, his father dies of a stroke underneath this tree. And that same night, lightning hits the tree, splits it in half, and he makes a bat out of that tree that was split by lightning, and he puts uh, Wonder Boy on it. <clears throat> so that's his magic bat. He's crushing all these home runs. There's a, a bat boy for the team uh, who asks him to help him make a bat. So he, he helps the kid make the bat, and um, <clears throat> I forget what the kid called the bat, but... Uh, they're in the big game at the end of the film, and Robert Redford's bat breaks. And, he, you know, he, he hits a foul ball. It was almost a home run. And then the little kid, uh, Bat Boy, comes up. And it's my favorite line in the film. They, they both look at the broken bat, and they look at each other, and Robert Redford says, Pick a winner, Bobby. <laughs> and then that the was great. And, and he, then he goes and gets the bat that they made together. Yes, that and was, then he hits a home run and they really win the game. Heartwarming. It's a wonderful yeah, film. Yeah, it is. Uh, and then the other movie we watched uh, was Tombstone with Val Kilmer. I had not seen it before. Which I find hard to believe. It's Yeah, uh, me too. It, I thought I had seen it, but no, I had not seen it. And it's a really good movie. And, well, that uh, one wasn't too violent for you? No. Uh, it wasn't, you know, the usual cowboy stuff. Well, like classic westerns, they don't show blood squirting when people get shot and stuff. So. Uh, there was well, one scene where there was a lot of blood, but um, it was really a great, great uh, movie. I enjoyed it very much. Wonderful film. And I remember uh, my favorite part watching it with you was at the beginning, there was like a, a Mexican wedding. That part was... And then the bad of, guys come in. Oh, and they, uh, they, they kill uh, people. They kill everybody. And then they sit down and eat the food that was yeah. meant for the wedding feast. That was horrible. And then the priest comes up yelling something in Spanish. And no, then, it was in Latin. Oh, it was in Latin. And then yeah. and then uh, one of the bad guys shoots the priest and kills him. Yeah. And I just turn to you and I go, uh, those are the bad guys. <laughs> yes, obviously. <clears throat> In case well, you hadn't that was out. that was the beginning of the movie. It was like, oh my god, okay. Um, yeah, we watch it because um, we we were talking about Val Kilmer. I've got this wonderful picture of Val Kilmer on my refrigerator, and it's a it's an eight by ten black and white picture of him as Mark Twain, and he was trying to do this movie about Mark Twain, and he was doing a one man show. And Mark Twain would smoke a cigar and come out and look at the audience before he performed. 
And I, I was really impressed before the show started. That's what Mark Tw- uh, Val Kilmer's Mark Twain did. And I was really excited about this being made into a movie. But then Val Kilmer has some kind of illness. Oh, and his throat is screwed up. And uh, uh, who knows how much time he has left. But that film's never going to be made. And wow. uh, I'm really grateful that Ashna and I, when we were staying in Culver City... At that Brazilian motel, remember mm. that place? Yes, we stayed Great, there with you. Colorful place. It was very nice. <clears throat> so it was just—it was right down the street from there. We were driving by and saw Val Kilmer as Mark Twain, and I got tickets and we got to see it. So, well, on this uh, Tombstone movie, he played uh, Doc. Holliday, Doc Holliday, and, it, and it, he did such a good job. It was really, really well done. He's got. It. I have not yet begun to defile myself. <laughs> And uh, he was a southern gentleman <clears throat> in the classic uh, I'm your Huckleberry now. Yeah, gosh. So I, I liked the movie. A brilliant film. Yeah, it was very good. So if you're looking for two happy uh, well, there was movies a, to watch uh, with your mom. It was a lot of killing, but <laughs> it was, <laughs> you know, the good guys win at the end. But these two films are Sarah Rhodes approved and <laughs> uh, we <laughs> with Sanitary Seal. Mm. For uh, for mother friendly, mm. so then we watched. We went into our art documentary uh, week, our studies, and I had, because we had burned through so many great BBC documentaries. Mm. I got on Amazon, and I I looked up art documentaries. So I ordered a ton of things, not knowing much about them. And the first one that we watched is called. Uh, it, it was a BBC documentary called How Art Made the World. What was his name? Uh, Dr. Nigel Spivey. And um, I didn't like this thing at all. Well, I, I, it had I, some good points. There was a couple of good stories that we yes. learned from it, but uh, his theories were really weak. Like, he goes to Australia, and they see the cave paintings, and then he talked about the cave paintings in, in France. And, you know, his theory was that these people took hallucinogenics, uh, they took drugs, basically, and that that's where art began. And I find that hard to believe because, you know, maybe someone wanted to... It's a theory. Like, I liked his theory that it, it, probably the first cave paintings were about hunting because they were mostly bison or boar or deer I think they came horses. out to uh, <clears throat> say that really it was uh, more like a religious uh, kind of thing. Yeah, but I, but, uh, I, I, but it's still I, I find it hard to believe that uh, drugs were why art became invented. I mean, I personally think art was invented to get women to take their clothes off. Um, uh, later on. <laughs> later. Sure. Not prehistoric. <laughs> <clears throat> but um, we, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but we did learn a few interesting things. Well, they talked about Stonehenge, and you had been to Stonehenge. It was almost a year ago at this time that I went to Stonehenge. And if, if you're ever in England, to go to Stonehenge, you go to some, you know, like gift shop ticket area, and then you board a little bus and they drive you there. And I don't know how much money it costs. <clears throat> And then you can't walk right up onto the stones themselves anymore. Um, there's like a path that you, you walk around it. But I was with English people who Googled it and learned that there's a free path for locals. And there's only one entrance to, to get. And we had to go down this long dirt road to get to the, the edge where this gate is. But it's this free path. And it's only 10 feet away from the path that people who spent 60 or $70 are walking on. I don't know, probably, who knows what it is, 40, 50 bucks. But um, if you ever go to Stonehenge, uh, Google the free path and the free gate, and it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just as, it's only 10 feet difference. Well, what I thought <clears throat> was interesting, that he had a story about a, a, a grave that they found near Stonehenge that uh, had a skeleton that they tested and it was 4,500 years old buried with like a hundred objects and they were two identical pieces of gold ornaments that were hair ornaments gold that had to be melted and shaped to be made into an ornament so archaeologists discovered that the man came from central Europe he wasn't from 
that area. Here. And they think this was this guy was the leader yes. who organized all the people to make Stonehenge <laughs> in the first place. Uh, <clears throat> because of all the objects that were buried with him, they figured that he had knowledge and power. Because art as a personal adornment enhanced and lifts you up above your peers. And so he, he had these kind of pimp <coughs> ponytail holders that were uh, made out of gold. And they figured maybe he used them <clears throat> on both sides of his face. And he had to organize uh, the stone hedge construction, so he had to have a lot of power. Yeah, I mean, he must have been a smart guy to, yeah. to engineer getting those massive stones to, um, you know, rolling them on logs or however they got them. One theory is that those uh, those stones were sent on, on, on boats. Uh, I mean, who knows if that's true? Who knows where the, you know, the stones actually came from? Hmm. But, um, but they were obviously from far places. They uh, weren't right there. I think it might have been just a urinal for um, concerts. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> who knows? So, what else do you have on the, on this guy? Uh, okay, so then he went. And that's interesting because it was basically like a King Tut's tomb. The guy was buried with with all this with, stuff. with all this fancy stuff and pottery and. Uh, and it was by Stonehenge. I had never heard that story before. Oh, I think that's <clears> kind of <throat> new. I hadn't heard about it either. So the next story he told was about Darius the Great in Iran, that he built uh, one of the ancient wonders of the ancient world. Persepolis. He built the city of Persepolis. Oh, okay. Uh, and his kingdom went all the way from the Mediterranean all the way to India, he had conquered more than 20 nations. So he had a, a problem as to how he could rule over such diverse people. So he offered peace and cooperation. So once a year he would call the ambassadors to come to his palace. And there was a large stair staircase with images of all the nations that he had ruled over, showing the ambassadors of the conquered people, bringing tribute to the king happy to honor the king. So this was like propaganda. Yeah, so they showed him the, the images on the staircase walking uh -huh. up was... Um, so uh, Nigel Spivey was saying this guy was the first person to use political imagery where they showed him as a great uh -huh. leader and uh, his theory was that this guy started that trend and other uh -huh. leaders have all used it since then. And that he communicated communicated his political vision through art, that he valued and respected the ambassadors. So uh, to reach regular people, he had a giant carved stone in the desert like a billboard inscribed with his figure carrying a bow as a symbol of his kingship, showing military power and control. The inscription showed his benevolent rule. He unified the empire and was to become one of the a world's greatest civilizations. Yeah, and that was interesting. That was interesting. Darius of Persepolis, Persepolis, and and then from there they went on to talk about Alexander the Great. Yes, and how Alexander the Great used political imagery uh, by putting his face on coins, and that everybody had a picture of him yes. in their pocket if you had any money. Yes, and uh, they found uh, Alexander. His father's tomb intact, which was uh, really a surprise because normally uh, tomb robbers would come and take all the stuff. Yeah, apparently they had robbed all the tombs, <clears throat> but they didn't they find that didn't one. They didn't find that, that one. So they were uh, surrounded by treasures, lots of gold, ivory carvings, and then they even found a face of Alexander the Great before he even got to be king. Yeah, and so they said that's how uh, we actually know what Alexander the Great looked like because there was no surviving statues of his head until that was found in his father's tomb. Well, uh, in Pompeii there was a mosaic, which was a copy of a Greek painting showing Alexander in the middle of fighting a battle. And he was seen as powerful in the battle. He was like charging the other king. The other king, uh, the king of the Persians, w looked like he was afraid and cowardly. So. It was like a, <clears throat> uh, a political uh, painting. 
since we're talking about the Persians, can we talk about our daily walks and how I think I've mentioned this before that there's so many beautiful trees in the neighborhood oh, and in yes. this park across the street and we've been taking pictures of it. I've been sending it to my girlfriend and then she's been sending it back to us. Uh, she puts it in this app called Picture This and then it tells you the name of a plant, of a, a tree or a, or a flower or whatever. It's really been great. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's and just, I, we looked yeah. up to get it, but it's twenty nine ninety nine for a year. And uh, so well, she's using the it. free 30-day trial. So we got <laughs> less than 30 days to keep finding out what, what these trees are. But so far in the neighborhood, my favorite tree is the African tulip tree. Yes, it was beautiful, beautiful. tree. Uh, and then the other tree that we loved is the Persian silk tree. And there's like five or six of them in the park yes. across the street. To think that uh, all these strange and exotic trees are like across the street in a public park. And I, I guess most people, uh, like we were, you just walk there and not even know that these are great exotic trees. And you took a picture of one of the pine trees. It's called the Monterey Cypress. It's the rarest tree in the world. And it only grows in two places up by Monterey Bay. It's it said on the picture of this, but uh -huh. there's like two of them growing in the park across the street. Yes, and they're beautiful trees. It looks like they like that area. We've seen carrot wood trees, the octopus tree, very beautiful. That was really cool. Uh, the crepe, the Indian crepe myrtle. Yes, it there's was a lot of those in the park. Different from the regular uh, crepe the kapak myrtles. tree, and the punk tree. There's a lot of punk trees in the park. Who would, Which, who would know this stuff? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a punk tree park. The cigar tree, the rubber plant, uh, coast was, live oak. There's yes, a, a bunch of coast was, live oaks at the really Third big. Street entrance. Yeah. The African senna tree. We love that one oh, with that the yellow great. flowers. Yellow flowers. And, uh, and that's it. So if you, if you want to do the 30-day 30, 30 free trial, it's, uh, it's a great app. So sorry, Mom. I, I you, yeah, that's you, men okay. you mentioned the Persians and, uh, and you thought about I, oh the Persian. I, I thought about the was, Persian silk tree. That was a beautiful tree. That's that, one of our favorites. From <clears throat> far away, it looks like the bottle tree, but when you come closer, it's uh, way more delicate, and uh, it really doesn't resemble the bottle brush tree that much. Yeah, but I, I think that, those tree. those are my two favorite trees on our yeah. walk: the Persian silk tree. And the African tulip tree. It was great. The African tulip tree had big um, tulip-like flowers that were red, maybe uh, three inches big. They were quite big. And Gorgeous. They, yeah, beautiful. Well, so should we get back to that? Yeah, yeah, sorry, Mom. Go ahead. Uh, uh, well, he, uh, he was trying to say that uh, political figures have used images of themselves to promote themselves, to persuade us to think the way they want us to think and to deceive us also. And the first person to do that was Augustus, 40 years before Christ. Uh, the Roman Rome, uh, Roman emperor. emperor. Uh, there were two parties in Rome. You could tell them apart be, by how they dressed. One group was dressed traditionally and old-fashioned and were the Republicans. The others were dressed with lively colors and were the non-archists monarchist who wanted a king. So Augustus came to power. He had a problem how to convince the Republicans he was not a, a threat to them. So they were suspicious of him. So he did this by having a statue built that is now in the Vatican Museum. He showed himself serious, humble, and the sculpture shows him as a general, powerful with a gesture of his statements in command. His feet were bare, it was a sign of humility. In his chest, uh, he had uh, scenes showing the acceptance of the surrender of his enemies. On the breastplate of his, uh, on, on, his on the statue, yes. he's wearing like armor, and on the yeah. breastplate is uh, a little scene. Yes, and then the gods were looking on with approval. He unified the... Yeah, so on the breastplate is a scene yes. of people surrendering to him right. as a conquering... Uh, hero and also that the gods were with him and he unified the two camps of Rome he portrayed himself as a peacemaker but it was a lie because behind the scenes he was <clears throat> eradicating the opposition he lived like a king in all but name 
He started a dictatorship that lasted 400 years. And um, the, uh, the uh, Nigel, what was his last Nigel name? Nigel Spivey. Spivey <clears throat> said, you know, that images can persuade people to hate, turn them against their neighbors, persuade them that some people are less than human. Then it was paint and marble, and now it's digital imagery. Yeah, he said, we humans are just as vulnerable now as we as those people to the persuasion were. of pow- uh, to the persuasive power of art. Mm. So, um, the, it, digital imagery might be how they're deceiving us now. Mom. Well, it's a, a an interesting theory. And then the next thing he talked about was that um, in Mesopotamian desert, where a civilization originated, they had farming, mathematics, organized society. An archaeologist found 25,000 broken clay tablets covered with what was then an unreadable language, the world's first language, cuneiform. I'm probably not saying that right. So so once they finally pieced it all together Uh, and cracked the code of this language, it's a story about this guy named Gilgamesh. And he was the world's first hero. Mm -hmm. And he killed lions, he killed people. He was just like a total badass. And uh, go ahead, Mom. Oh, uh, yes. He was the world's first He hero. was the supreme lion slayer. <laughs> and so uh, <clears throat> uh, this story is still told today. You can find... So, then the, uh, so, so most people couldn't read back then. And uh, there was this king of Syria, and his name was Ashurbanikov. In 645 B.C. And <clears throat> he had all these images put all over his palace of him as Gilgamesh. Mm-hmm. The hero. Killing the lions, killing people, just being the the great hero. So, I mean, imagine that that first dinner party he has when the palace is finished and uh, he's hoping nobody's read that book <laughs> <laughs> and that nobody calls him out for uh, stealing Gilgamesh's thunder and... <laughs> You know, hey, asshole, that's Gilgamesh. That's not you. You know, the in in, in comedy, the you know the uh, you know to to steal someone's joke uh, is 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 one of the worst crimes. Uh, Asher Benikoff stole Gilgamesh's whole act yeah. and yeah. tried to take credit for it, well, which he did take credit, <clears throat> and he got away with it. Uh huh. So, and I like that they had this. They, they, there was the one thing I liked about how art made the world was they interviewed this. This film director, um, George Miller, and George Miller directed the movie Babe, of the little, about a pig. And uh, when he was talking about this story about Gilgamesh, he said, um, and, and Asher Benikoff taking the story and putting his own image, you know, in this heroic story. This is a great quote. He said, "A hero cannot declare himself a hero. A hero is defined by the actions that they undergo." A hero is defined by the events that happen to them. And the spiritual and moral response is what makes the hero. And if you've seen the movie Babe, you know that's exactly what happens to that pig in that movie. He gets lost in New York City and then he has a uh, spiritual and moral response to being a pig lost in New York City. You missed that joke completely. I'm going, I'm going for a joke, and you're looking at your notes. <laughs> well, I'm picturing a, a pig in New York City. Uh, um, he, he, he made other films, but uh, but I, I, that, I that was I didn't see that movie, so I I think I that was uh, that really was my favorite part of that. How art made the world was oh. was when they interviewed George Miller, and and they and, showed some clips of that movie, so that well, was interesting. Well, but it reminds me of the Joseph Campbell hero with a thousand faces thing that the. There's certain patterns in a hero, Mm -hmm. and there's also certain patterns in people we consider cowards. You know, I mean, people who are heroes and they 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 endure difficult situations, they rise above it, they make the best of their circumstances. uh, They're magnanimous. They're not, you know, selfish. uh, I'm not sure that you can be a hero all the time. Maybe sometimes uh, you're not quite the hero, and then you end up. 
becoming a hero slowly. Well, like my mother says, when the rubber hits the road, is, <laughs> yeah. is you know, I mean, everybody, you know, the, the toil of everyday life, you know, you can't walk around being a hero. You're like Cervantes. Well, sometimes uh, you make mistakes. <clears throat> fighting windmills, you know? You make mistakes and then you learn. It, the happy the thing would be that you would learn from your mistakes and then correct them. That's hard. Well, I don't know how things turned out for Asher Banikoff. I'm going to have to Google that guy. and um, He probably did all right. <laughs> he did all right by well, what stealing he, someone else's story. <laughs> well, what he did was uh, also at the end they had like a warning where he had somebody's head. Well, they showed the king and queen in having a party and celebrating <clears throat> um, their victories. And uh, as a warning, they had somebody's head on the bushes, like if you try to come against this king, your head could be in mm. the bushes. So yeah. it was sort of like a warning, which was interesting. Um, yeah, those people were rough in the old days. People were rough. People are rough now. People are. <laughs> they were, human history is rough. We are rough. <laughs> so uh, is that all you have on on the? Uh, oh, let's see. Uh, I think. That's all we were going to talk about. Yes, yeah, so okay. and then the next DVD that we watched, and, and that one was a real stinker. Um, I, 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 I really, uh, you know, there was a few pieces of information that we enjoyed. You know, Gilgamesh, Ashurbanikov, Augustus, uh, the Stonehenge dude. Well, um, that was in... But, uh, but, I, but I, I really thought, uh, you know, usually you buy something and it's, the BBC is just like the gold standard especially for art documentaries. And um, wasn't that crazy about that one at all. And then the next one we got, um, it's called Vatican City, Art and Glory. <clears throat> and you and I went to Rome. Yes. With Ashna, what was that, five years ago? Something like that. And because we had been to Vatican City, I thought, oh, this would be a good one to get. And this DVD, and it's old too, I forget, you know, I think it was made in 2000 or something, but... The camera shots it was not very are from like a bus, and yeah. you can see glare from the glare of the of the moving bus going through the city, and then like he's in the Sistine Chapel, and like there was a lot of shaky camera shots. And I'm we're watching this thing, and I'm thinking, you know, I got better video footage when we were there, and uh, the 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 narration well, was kind of weak. Uh, it they certainly <clears throat> didn't. Uh, show how wonderful that place was. Uh, I thought they did not uh, do a good job showing. No, it was like a, it was a lot of uh, you know tourist video footage, shaky. You know, well, it, it, uh, well, uh, I, I'm, I'm surprised that it was sort of amateurish. Let's say that it was very okay. it was very amateurish. Okay. But I I'm surprised that um, um, the you know the it had the Vatican's name on it. Well. Uh, we did <clears throat> learn a few things, which was... Tell us what we learned, Mom. <laughs> I already knew some of it, but we'll go ahead and repeat it, that the Vatican City is the smallest principality in the world, has its own newspaper, radio, and TV. Its own post office. Remember we went... Yes. I we went to went the post there, office. Yeah. I bought a bunch of stamps. Right. And I mailed... Because um, when we would go there, we would get a... Uh, not Airbnb, when we would go there, we found it on sleepinitaly.com. And I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but we stayed about four or five blocks from yes, you could Vatican see, City. You could see it from the, <clears throat> the windows of the place. Yeah, you could, from, from yeah. the living room where we were saying you could see the dome of St. Peter's. It was great. Lit up at night, and that was cool. And so I, I, I mailed things from that post office uh -huh. just because, oh my God. It's the Vatican Post Office. Yeah, it was. And the story really that cool. I remember um, around Vatican City when we went there, they sell these little bottles. They look like little perfume bottles, but they're so you can put holy water in it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they had different ones with different popes on it. So I got a Pope John Paul II. I got a Pope Benedicto, and then the last time we went was when Saint Francis was a pope. So. Pope you know, Francis. Pope Francis. Yes. And <clears throat> I'm walking there. There's a fountain inside. There's some fountains inside uh, Vatican City, you know, around the colonnade. And there's the big open 
courtyard with the obelisk and that's where the Pope gives the Sunday Mass and everything. And, you know, if you just get water out of a fountain, it's not holy. So I'd filled them all these things up and you had a couple and I think Ashna had a couple. And so we, we filled up the water and, you know, it's the Vatican. It's the headquarters of Catholicism. So there's tons of priests and nuns walking around. So I had filled him up and I go, mom, we need to get a priest to bless these. And you just stopped this guy. And he didn't he speak English. I don't, or I don't know if he spoke English. Well, it was but you priest. like, you're, you're asking him, can he bless the water? He and he looked it. like he was on, on his way to lunch or a meeting or something. Yeah. And he just like shrugged. And then he put his hands over the, I'm, I'm holding the holy water um, bottles in my hand. Yeah. Like, you know, we bought some for souvenirs. Yeah. And I had like eight of them. It was, and and it was so great. You stopped this priest, and then you know he figured, you know he got the picture. rather than resist. Yeah. If I do this, it'll be over quicker than uh, uh, resisting. So he blessed them as I as I held them. That was one that of my was cool. And uh, I just, almost forgot about that. Yeah, it just shows you how the power of mom well. uh, can get things done. <laughs> you know, and then they're blessed. Yeah. So, well, he was he he did it. <laughs> the other memory I have from when we were in Rome was how it was so hot, and we remember we walked so much at the end of every day. Mm. We would all our feet would be killing us. Yes. We were so exhausted. I, I was so tired one day. I just didn't go with you guys, even though I really wanted to see what there was. You you and Ash and I love Caravaggio, so you'd go to every <laughs> Caravaggio. Uh, painting you could find and it they were all over the city well the very yeah. first time Ashin and I went to Rome I paid for a Caravaggio walking tour mm. and so they took us to all these places where all of his paintings were so th when we took you there we knew where all the Caravaggios were yes. so it was yeah. like when you and I were in Israel when we were in Jerusalem that first day we did the walking tour mm. and then after that we knew where all the stuff was, <laughs> right. and we didn't need a guide, you know. So, you could go on um, your own. Yeah. so it, it that that's the good reason to do a, a a walking tour of something you're interested in on the very first day you arrive in somewhere like Rome or Jerusalem. There was so much to see anyway. It was art overload. Art that, overload. <laughs> but uh, oh. what did you learn about the Vatican City from this uh, DVD? Well. I already knew a little bit. Bernini designed St. Peter's Square in 1656, and he had four pillars deep semicircle on a colonnade, and it signifies like the church open arms that everybody's welcome. And it has 147 statues of saints all on top of the colonnades. Uh, there's also an 85-foot Egyptian obelisk that was brought there by Caligula in 319 A.D. Uh, in 1506, Julius... And it was put in its present place by Pope Sixto. Oh, uh, I think that's yes. A, that's a really cool name, Sixto. <laughs> that's, that, is, that is cool. I'm glad you could pronounce it well. In 1506, Julius II turned down the first basilica and then... That was built by Constantine, and he built a new one. And it took 120 years to build, 10 architects and 20 popes. Uh, Nero burned the city and blamed the Christians. This is where Peter was crucified upside down, because he didn't want to be crucified like Jesus And that's was. where the uh, obelisk is? Where they, uh, it's in the center, right? No, I think uh, they had just a, a big medallion if I remember. It's been a, a Been a while. few years, yeah. <laughs> there is so much art in that place, it's, uh, you just are overwhelmed. Well, I mean, we watched, a, one of the earlier things we watched, um, when they talked about Michelangelo, uh, like two months ago, there was the story where he made, the, he designed the dome of St. Peter's Basilica, still to this day considered one of the most beautiful artistic domes ever made. And uh, the interesting thing we learned a couple months ago from one of those art documentaries was that he didn't charge the Vatican any money for that dome because he wanted God to forgive him for um, some of the um, 
some of his gay tendencies that he had during his lifetime. I thought that was one of the most interesting facts. It's a beautiful dome. Um, and uh, Michelangelo designed the Swiss guard uniforms. Yes. That which, was... and that's another thing on that DVD, the guy didn't have a good shot of the, yeah, we I got, got we beautiful got... shots of we those did. Swiss guards. And it's uh, this multicolored uniform that the Swiss guards white. wear. Yes. And I wonder if when Michelangelo turned in his design, that's when everybody figured out that he was gay. I thought I'd use all the colors. Oh, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> They're beautiful uniforms. Yes. But I couldn't see fighting in them. Because uh, they look, they look like a, they they're almost like a, they're almost like jester uniforms. Um, they're really different, but you know they wore different outfits in those days. <laughs> and there was a history about not in, in this uh, video that we watched, but uh, at some point uh, about the Swiss guards, why the Swiss were chosen. Yeah, why did they choose the Swiss? I think the Swiss were <clears throat> are really good fighters. So, and loyal Catholics or something like that? I'm not sure. Everybody was Catholic in those days. Yeah. So uh, there is a statue of St. Peter. There was a a black statue. I remember seeing that. And everybody went and uh, rubbed the Oh, you touched the it. You rubbed the, yes. the toe. Yeah, yeah, we did that. We did that. We stood in yeah. line to touch his dirty feet. Now you wouldn't touch... Uh, well, that's, it's funny how we watch everything now. Well, Through maybe. the COVID-19 lens, we were like, oh, my God, I wouldn't touch that thing now. <laughs> well, maybe you'd clean your hands before and after. Uh, and there's lots of Michelangelo and Raphael and Ramundi. Uh, well, Michelangelo, the Piatra, which it's the Virgin Mary is holding her son, and she looks young. She, they almost look like, they, like they're the same age. And it's she, a beautiful One sculpture. of the most beautiful sculptures ever made. Beautiful. Michelangelo made that when he was 21 years old. Absolutely beautiful. And then when yeah. we were in Rome, uh, the thing that blew my mind, w reading all this history and different stuff, I think it was in 1989, some Hungarian man uh, attacked it with a hammer. Yes. And smashed it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it smashed it, it, a leg, I think. It was. I think he smashed a lot of it, and it took uh, him twenty years to restore the thing. And uh, that man uh, was banned from Italy for life, mm -hmm. and he's still alive in Hungary. And it's possible to hunt him down and find him. Well, <laughs> I don't think I want to meet that guy. Well, well he's got issues. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, one interesting story that they did say was. Uh, that Raphael was Bermonti's protege, and he talked uh, Pope Julius II into forcing Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel. Yeah, so Bermonti and Michelangelo were rivals. Yes. And uh, they didn't care for each other. And so they, the Bermonti, and uh, who knows if Raphael was in, involved, but they kind of nudged the Pope to get. Michelangelo to do this painting so they could show that he was the inferior painter. So there's the hero story. Yes, he, you know, uh, to he's, show he, him up uh, as a, <clears throat> a painter because he wasn't a painter. He was an artist. He was a sculptor. A sculpture, and he didn't want to do it. And then he does one of the greatest pieces of art in human history. Yes. And they thought he was going to end up looking bad. Well, it, uh, that's what happens when you're trying to do something nasty. <laughs> yeah. It turns on you. Well, and then I thought a funny detail that they showed that um, on the Garden of Eden scene, Michelangelo painted the devil uh, as a woman. That was uh, interesting. It was uh, really different. Um, and uh, at the end of his life in 1541, he Michelangelo painted a, a, a big, a very large painting of the Last Judgment. Lots of people didn't like it. And Michael, Alan, uh, Michelangelo's uh, painted one of the critics in the hell section with a snake around his body uh, to... I like that story. And, it, <clears throat> and then one thing I really liked about Rome is Rome is full of revenge stories. Like when we went to the um, uh, the Trevi Fountain. <clears throat> Apparently, 
And it's and that's one of the most beautiful things in the world yes, to yes, get a gelato was. and sit in front of that is just uh, it, it, it's a a soul calming. Uh, beautiful, peaceful yes, moment. Yes, it was uh, really <clears throat> nice I, but, when I was. Uh, I'm sorry, honey. Do you remember the story that there was a guy who had a business who complained about the fountain? He had a business right there. Hmm. So the uh, sculptor, architect, designer, whatever you call the man who made the Trevi Fountain, put a big uh, a rock thing in front of this man's business so he couldn't see it. Do you remember that story? Because uh, he had complained during the construction. Yes, of it. I think I remember <clears throat> that. So I love that Michelangelo painted the guy who criticized his painting uh, as being in the the hell section. Yes. Uh, one thing I wanted to remind you, I don't know if for sure I told you about this, when I was at that Trevi <clears throat> Fountain, and I saw this uh, guy dressed up like a, a Roman soldier, and he was uh, on his phone, and I thought, oh, what a clash. Here he is, dressed as a Roman soldier with, uh, you know... A modern a modern in- <clears throat> Yeah, so I took his picture. Oh, he followed me around and wanted money. Until I finally gave him some money, he wouldn't shut up about it. You know, he said it was his business. Yeah, it's like on Hollywood Boulevard, people dress up like superheroes. Spider-Man and, you know, they'll do, <clears throat> you know, whoever, Batman. And they've, they're they doing it because they want... if you take their picture, they'll hound you until you pay them. Yeah. <gasps> that was uh, a tourist thing you have to look out for it when you go to Rome. Um well, maybe you have to go ahead and pay them and take <clears throat> Well, I mean, and, you know, you only got to give them yeah. a dollar. So well, there was one time I was I there with was... Ashna, and I paid the guy in the Roman thing a dollar and on the video. Was it a dollar? Good well, heavens, well, I don't you, even remember. You can give them whatever you want. Well, so I said... Uh, I think he asked me for a certain amount. <clears throat> I don't remember exactly. On the video that I made of Rome, when mm-hmm. I went there with Ashna the first time, there's the Roman guy and the soldier, and I said, uh, if you give them one dollar... They'll let you um, poke them in the chest with their sword, because I'm on the video. Oh, I should and, have known uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> so for one dollar, <coughs> you can stab the guy with his own sword in his chest. Plate. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> so yeah. Well. So you know, there's there's a way to flip these uh, tourist swindles into your favor. Well, we don't want to get too violent. It was a very playful tap, Mom. There was nothing violent about it. Okay. I. Uh, I thought it was interesting that Raphael Bramante and Michelangelo were all painting in Rome at the same time. Mm, that was and then uh, this Pope Julius was bullying them oh, yeah. into that and kind of working them off of each other. And then Bramante had designed some scaffolding and wanted oh, yeah. Michelangelo to use it for the Sistine Chapel. Mm. And Michelangelo is such a cool dude. Uh, he said, uh, sorry, bro, Monte. Uh, he designed his own scaffolding, which became the scaffolding that everyone uh, in Rome and painters used from from that time onward. And um, Michelangelo lived until he was 89 years old. Mm. Wow. With no hand, hand sanitizer or... Um, yes, he must have been pretty vitamins? strong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he did beautiful work. I mean, whatever he did, it was beautiful. Um, do you have anything else on the Vatican? No. Are you ready to move on to the Louvre? Yes. <clears throat> so the next DVD that we watched, uh, it was it's called The Louvre, and it was made in 1987 for American television. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a little dated because it's 1987, but I thought it was excellently yeah, done. It was good. I really enjoyed it. First, they showed the history of of how the Louvre came into being and the the history of the building and uh, Charles uh, Boyer did the tell tell uh, us tell us tell us all about was, the history, uh, Mom. Uh, well, uh, you got as much as I did, I think. Uh, one of the cool uh, history uh, things that the French were very proud of the Louvre and. Uh, <clears throat> It's part of their history, and one of the stories that I think they're most proud of is that that while uh, politicians were talking about peace with uh, Hitler, with Hitler, leading up to World War Two, yes, the French people were responsible for the Louvre. They didn't trust Hitler. They knew they some shit was anybody. coming. <laughs> and no, Hitler, 
was the problem yes. in World War II. Uh, they didn't trust what was happening in the world, knew Hitler was a bad guy, and right. bad shit was coming their way. So, so months before World War II broke out, they removed every single piece of art from the Louvre. They had trucks moving stuff out. They sent it to secret caves, cellars all over America, or all over oh, France. France. And then when the Nazis arrived, Goring, Hitler's uh, dude, was very excited about uh, looting and plundering great artworks yes. from these conquered nations of Europe. And he was basically salivating when him and the, these other Nazis went into the Louvre and... They found nothing. There was nothing there for them. And they did not get one single piece of art from the Louvre. And one uh, interesting point was that uh, one of the paintings was so large that it was hidden in the ceiling of a restaurant that the Nazis frequented. And, so the Nazis... And they never knew. The Nazis dined under this painting every painting. night. Yeah. And it was well, it was uh, it was a painting from uh, the from Louvre, the, yes. And it was they massive, and they had nowhere else to hide it. Right. So they bolted it to the ceiling of this restaurant. Yes, that was interesting. And so when uh, after the Nazis left, uh, you know, were, they were defeated. Everything came back to the Louvre. I mean, they have three hundred thousand works of art there. Two million people a year visit the Louvre. And it has the uh, world's <clears throat> largest collection of art. And the building itself is full of history. There's a gallery of art in the roof. Fifty kings and queens lived there, also poets and politicians. The Louvre is, is in the middle of Paris, and Paris grew around the Louvre. It's been at the heart of Paris for 800 years. That was uh, pretty interesting. And at one point, Philip Augustus built a fortress there. This was a long time ago. And prisoners were chained and tortured there. It, and uh, it was a place after that where they kept dogs. And they may have kept lepers there also. That was Yeah, one theory to, is that the, yeah. the name, the Louvre, no one knows what it means, yes. where it comes from. And one of the theories was that that might have been a word for leper because they... Be. Lepers were kept in this area. They don't really know what it means, so that was interesting. And then they built a a a palace on top of what used to be... All these French kings added to it little by little through the years. Uh, The French Revolution made the Louvre... So it was filled with all these beautiful works of art. Yes. And uh, the French Revolution made the Louvre a public museum. Mm -hmm. And it was a public museum after the French Revolution for six years until Napoleon came to power. And then Napoleon acted like a king and um, that became one of his palace palaces and Napoleon filled the Louvre with art uh, that he had stolen and plundered from conquered nations. <clears throat> Which one of the, brings up one of the most interesting stories about the Louvre. Uh, there was an Italian guy I read this story years ago, so so a lot of the some of the details, because I think he worked at the Louvre, yes. But he stole the Mona Lisa, uh-huh. and he wanted to return it to Italy because he thought it was one of the pieces that had been stolen from Italy by Napoleon. <clears throat> but Leonardo da Vinci was unhappy with Italy and the leaders in Italy, and he felt that he didn't get the recognition that he deserved in Italy. And then um, King Francis. I think his name was in France, <clears throat> was a big supporter of the arts and sciences, and he invited Leonardo da Vinci to live in uh, in France. And, and he so went there. Leonardo da Vinci painted the Madonna and Child for Francis, and apparently he gave uh, Francis the Mona Lisa also. So this Italian guy that stole the Mona Lisa, he he slept with it under his bed for four years. He should have uh, <clears throat> listened to the history lessons more because yeah. he didn't know what really had happened. Well, we should all study history a little bit more. I think uh, when we were there in that giant um, in Italy, uh, and we went to the big museum, <clears throat> they talked about um, Napoleon's sister having married a friend, uh, an Italian guy that had all this art. And he gave her just a 
little bit of money for the art that he took from her palace, which had all kinds of Italian art. So he could say that he bought the paintings. Uh, so they were not returned to Italy after Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo. What a crumb. Yeah, so uh, although uh, other countries came and tried to take their uh, treasures back home, uh, France kept a lot of <clears throat> a lot of the um, items. Yeah, uh, I liked from the Louvre uh, special from 1987. They said that mother and child is one of the eternal themes of art. Mm -hmm. That's you and I, mommy. Oh, <laughs> this podcast is an eternal theme of art. Well, and <clears throat> excuse me, they have the Van Gogh painting, Doctor Gachet, and they said that, uh, and I have the book of letters of Van Gogh, uh, and it's all the letters that he wrote back and forth to his brother Theo, and it's great. That's how they know what Van Gogh was feeling about all these different paintings and what he was going through in his life because he's describing everything to his brother Theo in these letters when he would send him a bundle of paintings that Theo couldn't give away yeah, uh, and now are among the most valuable yes. artworks in the world. But uh, there's a painting of Dr. Gachet when he was living in Arla, France. Hmm. And uh, he's got his, his face in his hand. Yes. And uh, Van Gogh wrote to his brother Theo that I have painted Dr. Gachet wearing the distressed expression of our times. Oh. Well, so I, I, that, I thought that, that was it. I, I remember that painting. Yeah, it was interesting. But he's wearing the distressed expression of our times. I think probably people alive today could relate to uh, He didn't look Dr. all that Gashi. distressed. But, uh, yeah, he looked pretty calm. But Yeah, but uh, I thought it was, you know, a really great painting. When I came to visit you in Amsterdam, I went to the Van Gogh Museum. It was really terrific seeing uh, the originals. So it is really great when you get a chance to see an original, even though like you've seen um, lots of um, copies. Uh, the original always seems to be better somehow. Um, well, I remember you bought the year pass to the Van yes. Gogh Museum. <laughs> And I used, and I only lived a few blocks from there on Lunga Lydza Dwarstraat. <laughs> and uh, I went there about 10 times that year after you left me that, that year pass. Um, and, uh, and that other place <clears throat> where all the Rembrandt paintings The, the Rijksmuseum. Yeah, the Rijksmuseum. Lots and lots of stuff to see there. And the right and the Rembrandt House. Oh, they <clears throat> had museums all over that town. Oh, since we're talking about Holland, I'm glad you, we mentioned this. My um, friend Jasper in Holland who sent that wonderful box to me last that month full really of things. Yeah. There was this little plastic stick oh, yes. with a handle and then like kind of a, a little, I don't know how you describe it. It wasn't a scooper, but it was just like a, a flat edge on the end of this stick. Mm -hmm. And I was describing the contents when I was opening the box because it was all these wonderful Dutch treats. And then uh, Jasper and I were writing back and forth. And that little thing is so Dutch, it's to get out the last bit of sauce out of a jar. But and the thing that, yeah. like, the stereotype of Dutch people is that they're cheap. And, uh, you know, being in a 10-year relationship uh, with a Dutch person, uh, you know, Ashna was very frugal, but even when I lived in, in Amsterdam, you know, there's certain things about being smart with your money, like... Where I lived to take the tram, when I lived in Volter Grafsmeer, uh, the tram stop, I forget, it was like, I think four euros or something to get into the city center, or I forget what it was, but like, if I walked three blocks to the next tram stop, it was like half the price. Hmm. So I would just never walk take the, the stop in front of where I lived, I would walk the three blocks just to save you know, two euros or whatever yes. it was. So um, I, I, I don't say that in a critical way. I, I think being frugal and smart with your money is something that took me a long time to learn in my life and in, in my time living in Amsterdam and 
uh, being in a 10-year relationship with Ashna, I, I learned smart ways not to just piss money away. And I think it's a, such a genius Dutch invention, only the Dutch would think of, to make an instrument to get like the last little bit of mayonnaise or mustard or whatever out of a jar. And um, I think I'm going to... I'm going to ask Jasper, I'm going to send him some money. I'm going to get him to send me uh, a bunch of these. And I want to start giving them out to people. <laughs> I could or probably like, use it. <laughs> I, I, I think it's such a b- brilliant, funny gift and, and, and very practical. I, I'd never seen one like that before. Just to get that last yeah. 18 cents worth of well, uh, sauce out of a jar. It was an old <clears throat> saying that if you watch your pennies, the uh, dollars would mound up. Something like that. I forgot the exact saying. I got to find out the name of it from Jasper, and I, I got to get him to send me a box of those things. <laughs> so, okay, so the last thing we watched last night was a DVD about the life of Georgia O'Keeffe. And I've been to Santa Fe, New Mexico <clears throat> when Ashton and I were living out of the car and driving all over America and doing gigs. Uh, we took about three trips to Santa Fe, New Mexico. If you ever go to New Mex- Santa Fe, New Mexico, you got to stay in this hotel. It's called the El Rey Inn. And all the rooms are like adobe buildings. And each room has a fireplace. And we stayed there in winter <clears throat> a couple times. Snow everywhere. So beautiful. And at this hotel, they'll bring you as much firewood as you want. So it's freezing outside. There's snow. You're staying in this cool little New Mexico uh, adobe building and uh, it's so cool that they just keep bringing you firewood and uh, I, I highly recommend it uh, and and that Santa Fe is where the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum is and you know that's <clears throat> one of the highlights of, of visiting Santa Fe and if, if you go there dear listener you got to stay at the Santa the El Rey Inn yes I knew you had <clears throat> gone there because you told me when you did that loved it beautiful place <clears throat> so um I, I i'm a fan of georgia o'keefe i mean you know you've hear you've you know one of the things you always hear about her is like uh vagina flowers you always hear people compare her thing but i think she was really probably one of the greatest modern american painters and she she really forged her own way uh in her painting style the way she lived her life and I just find her to be uh, one of the most fascinating um, Americans, uh, most fascinating painters, artists. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I think she's just... A great she's, uh, woman painter. She's just a sure. bad... Well, I wouldn't say woman painter because she didn't want to be remembered as a woman painter. Oh, that's true, yeah. So you shouldn't say she's a woman painter. Okay, but she was She wanted a woman. to be remembered as a... <laughs> yes, but she as wanted... As a great artist. She wanted to be yeah. remembered as a great artist. And... <clears throat> um, her, she had an affair. Go ahead, Mom. Do you want to you want to start this? Okay. Uh, she was born in 1887 in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, in a large dairy farm. I guess her family had a large dairy farm, and she had a happy childhood. Her mother and her grandmother also painted. She loved nature and the natural world. She studied art in Virginia, Chicago, and New York, and at one point. Uh, She looked at her paintings critically and thought they were too influenced by all the art teachers she had had, so she destroyed them all. She felt they were not original. So uh, she painted uh, in New York and... uh, Well, so she she was an art teacher in San Antonio. She was a high school art teacher for two years in San Antonio, Texas, and she's painting. There was someone she knew in New York that she sent some of her uh, charcoal etches and paintings to. And the friend in New York showed them to this guy, Alfred Stieglitz. Stieglitz. <clears throat> he was a photographer, and he also had his own gallery. And he showed them in his gallery. And Georgia O'Keeffe went there, and she was angry at this guy, and she was demanding them back. He and didn't ask her permission. He didn't ask for her permission. And... Um, <clears throat> he ends up, ends up being pretty much uh, one of the most important people in her life. They had a they started an affair. He was married at the time, and um, 
he used to write about her in in art journals, and he really um, he helped spread the uh, you know the the word on her talent. And <clears throat> he was a photographer, and I think it was at that museum in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I saw a couple of topless photos of her. And it turns out in 1921, uh, Alfred Stieglitz exhibited dozens of nude portraits of her. And while he was still married to another woman, and it was like a huge scandal uh, in the art world. <clears throat> it was powerful. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Um, and I, so they, they started a relationship and she was 30 years old. He was 53. And uh, he convinced her to move to New York City and he, he's helping her with her painting. And in 1925, they moved to the one of the upper floors of the Shelton Hotel, which was considered one of the first skyscrapers in the world. And she's up there painting clouds and scenes of the city. I think that's such a... I, I, another reason why I love her is it seems like they had a really fun happy romance for a while and I love the the thought of them living up on top of this hotel in 1925 and there was one painting I think it's called the radiator building or the the uh ambition city I forget which painting it was but uh on instead of one of the advertising signs or one of the signs on top of a hotel uh she put uh his name, his name yeah Stieglitz uh she painted like two dozen paintings of New York buildings. That was pretty interesting. And she tried to uh, capture the sound <clears throat> through radiating lines, molding patterns and shapes on foundational lines. She painted fragments of things because it seemed to make a statement of the whole. Uh, she also inspired her husband to photograph nature, clouds, and even lightning. Yeah, they ended up getting married at one point, yes. uh, apparently she was against being married, um, but he 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 wanted he insisted on it. Um, they didn't even talk about when they got married. They just said, "Yeah, that, they, they kind of breezed through." A, I uh, found out a lot of through a whole bunch. <clears throat> I'll tell you because I found out a lot of information after we watched the thing and you went to bed last night. I couldn't remember Stieglitz's name, hmm. so I googled Go Georgia O'Keeffe's boyfriend, and this other story came up that I'm going to tell you about in a minute, but let's just go over the, the main details of her life. Uh, in 1929, she went to New Mexico and spent the summer there and painted. And then from then on, she would, uh, she would spend the summer in New Mexico painting and then spend the winter with Stieglitz in New York City. And then when, oh, and then she first stayed at the Ghost Ranch, which oh. is where she loved to paint in 1934. Um, but in 1946, Stieglitz died, and then that's when she moved permanently to New Mexico. And after World War II, people might, like it must have been like now, like people like want to travel. There's going to be such a desire for people to travel and get out and and see the world after um, not being able to go anywhere right now. So she started traveling the world after World War II in 19 what. Uh, 1953 she toured France and Spain uh, 1953 at 69 years old she went to Peru did you have yes she went to uh, drove from Lima to the An In, uh, into the Andes to see the Inca cities <clears throat> and when she was 72 she visited Japan and India 1959 she's 72 years old goes to Japan and India then later she went to Hong Kong the Philippines Cambodia the Pacific Islands, the Middle East, Baghdad, Beirut, Jerusalem, Egypt, Greece, and Italy. I love that she traveled so much. She did. Uh, and she also went whitewater rafting in the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon, which I think was pretty dangerous. Pretty dangerous. And she did that twice as an older woman. Yeah. And she, she took her last trip at the age of 96 and it was a return visit to the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. Do you have anything else? Um, <clears throat> I like she said, where I was born and how I lived is unimportant. What is imp it is what I have done with where I have been is what should be of interest. 
and uh, I liked it. It was from one of the art documentaries we watched a couple months ago. They had mentioned Georgia O'Keeffe, and it was my favorite sentence from from that thing that all these men artists and this you know male dominated uh, art world. They kept telling her that you know you'll never get any recognition. You'll never get any recognition because you're a woman. So she felt that because she would never get any recognition, she was free to do whatever she wanted to do. And I, 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 I just, I, I think that's a, a really beautiful thought, and uh, it, it gives me inspiration. That, well, I thought that, that uh, what they said in this uh, documentary was that she uh, liked flowers and that. Um, she thought people didn't look at them. Oh, that was a, uh, that great. That was a, an interesting. She's point a, she that felt that people in the city were too busy and to look, look inside of a small flower. So that if she painted them real big, they couldn't miss it. But then people started saying all kinds of uh, stuff of meaning that she had. Uh, she was sort of amazed at what people would say and write about her paintings. Which was kind of interesting. Yeah, like she didn't think it was she was doing uh, female anatomy. She felt like she was doing flowers. Uh, that was interesting. And uh, another thing they, they had said was that President <clears throat> Gerald Ford gave her the Medal of Freedom, which is the highest civilian medal you could get. Yeah. I, I think George O'Keefe is such a badass. And... Um, so I after, we, after you went to bed last night, I googled... Uh, George O'Keefe's boyfriend, and this story popped up from Bizarre, Bizarre Magazine, not Bizarre, Bizarre as in uh, shopping area. Um, well, they Georgia have, O'Keefe's yeah. younger yeah. man, Georgia O'Keefe's intimate relationship with Juan Hamilton, 58 years her junior, was an art world scandal. So there was, they were, in, 19, in 2016, in London, at the Tate Modern Museum, they were going to do an exhibition on Georgia O'Keeffe's life's work, and <clears throat> that's when this story was. Uh, th that's when the story was written. Juan Hamilton was a broke twenty-seven-year-old when he first walked into Georgia O'Keeffe's secluded studio in Ghost Ranch, New Mexico, hoping she might give him a job. <clears throat> so he had just gotten divorced. He's from Vermont. He moves to New Mexico. And he becomes like her handyman, doing everything. Um, doo -doo -doo -ba -doo -boop. Rumors abounded that Georgia and I were secretly married, but Georgia thought that it was funny as could be. She loved it. Um, where is it? Uh, 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 uh. Well, there was something about the, the in the documentary we watched that when she was older, she um, started doing pottery. And that uh, some young man they said, and this is the guy who that's the he young was the guy. Man. And I, Juan I said Hamilton. to you when you mentioned it to me this morning, I said, I bet it was that guy that did pottery. And you said, Yep, that it was him. Because you know, pottery oh. always leads to bad things. <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> um oh. Yeah, so this is the this is the guy who got her into to, he was like trying to be a pottery artist. So uh he gets a job as her handyman but be, but he starts doing everything. She paid me five dollars an hour to work in the garden, six dollars an hour to drive her places, and seven dollars an hour to type. It wasn't a high-paying job, but I didn't have anything else going on in my life. I was recently divorced and starting a new life. And Georgia was one of the most interesting women I had ever met. Um, and then their relationship grew more complicated a few months later. When the architect, Alexander Gerard, and his wife Susan, old friends of O'Keeffe's, invited her to, to Morocco and told her she could bring a friend if she wanted. So she asked me to come with her, recounts Hamilton. And that's when the trouble started. So they were on this trip. So we went off to Morocco and traveled almost 3,000 miles together during a month and a half. We went everywhere together and we got along. I could help her feel independent. She could tell people, he is my, she would tell people, he is my eyes and ears. The job wasn't always a picnic though. She was pretty demanding. She was no flower. And when she was in a bad mood, boy, she was tough. But over time, she developed an affection for me that I wasn't expecting or looking for. 
So this in itself, like she was the scandal for Stieglitz when he did these nude photos of her in 1921 and she was his girlfriend, you know, uh, 23 years younger than her. And then now when she's older, this was the scandal of the art world that she was with Juan Hamilton, who is 58 years younger than her. Um, and then she left Juan Hamilton in her will two of her homes and a big chunk of uh, her vast fortune. Where's the thing? What do you think, Mom? Well, I think you were reading it to me earlier and that he returned the money to her estate. That's Uh, the part that I'm trying to find. Yeah. uh, Thanks for saying that. He didn't want to live off her money. He wanted to live off his own uh, pottery uh, art. Yeah, so he gave the money back. I can't find it. Oh, well. He just, he, 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 just, he gave uh, a large uh, portion of the money and whatever was left to him uh, to her family estate. He's They hired him as a consultant, but he gave up a considerable fortune mm-hmm. um, because he, he wasn't in it for the money. He said he lived off of his own money. Right. And... Um, it, it, it you know he had such a special relationship with her it wasn't about the money that he um you know he could have totally cleaned up well uh <coughs> that was interesting but uh i uh, guess that she fell for the same thing uh, uh famous men fall for you know people come and they admire you so much uh, of course you're tempted and it's a shame to think that uh, she had clay feet, but there you are. Clay feet, what do you mean by that expression? Well, <laughs> all heroes have clay feet, and it comes from the Bible about this uh, statue that was built with a gold head, and it went, uh, it represented all the um, kingdoms that would come, and at the end they would have clay feet. The, the statue was... Um, so it, heroes aren't really heroes? No. Uh, what, does the, what, human, does, what does the expression mean to you? I, that they're human and they uh, can fall, you know. Uh, okay, it doesn't sound to me like she's falling. It sounds to me like she's having a good time with a younger guy. I don't... Why would well, that morally, have to, she... Uh, why, is, why is that morally wrong? I don't know. Uh, if uh, she was a younger... If older men artists can be with younger women, mm-hmm. why can't... Uh, I, I think it's uh, a great story that she all right, maybe was a younger guy and they were traveled and they, yeah. they obviously had uh, a special enough relationship that she left him two houses yeah. and uh, several million dollars. Hmm. Uh, the rumors about O'Keefe and Hamilton persisted even after he got married to a woman he'd met at O'Keefe's house, no less. I arrived one morning and Anna Marie was waiting in the driveway with a friend, hoping to meet Georgia. In the first 15 minutes with Anna Maria, I knew I was in trouble. I told Georgia, and she said, Good, you'll need somebody when I'm gone. After O'Keefe died, Hamilton quickly gave her... After O'Keefe died, Hamilton quickly gave over most of what she'd left him to her family's estate, which is now controlled by a board of trustees. He serves as a special consultant. There was a lot of talk about how much money I got, but I turned down a huge amount just to have my freedom, he says. I'm not living off what Georgia left me. I've been living off my work and wits. And uh, there was a story in this thing that when she left him everything, someone in her family sued him that he had coerced her into signing this will. Uh, for $13 million and uh, somebody interviewed him about it and he's just a guy that makes pottery and he said $13 million boy that's a lot of pots <laughs> so they kind of made fun of him in the press and he's yeah. he's now he's an, he's an older man now looking back mm. and he says well I guess that was kind of a dumb thing to say but I think it's very funny <laughs> it was funny and and very loving that he um, he uh, Gave, gave back, back the money. all the stuff. Yeah, that was good. It's like the end of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory when Charlie gives back his everlasting gobstopper. 
because he was just grateful to know Willy Wonka and have a tour of the factory. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's uh, that, that's everything that we prepared this week. Mom, do you have any uh, uh, other thoughts or... Not uh, really. Uh, well wishes for the people? <laughs> well, stay well and uh, keep wearing your mask. I guess that will help. Wash your hands, stay happy, hopefully... Uh, Eat well. Exercise. Exercise. And uh, thank you so much for listening to the program. And uh, why don't we play Scrabble now, Mom? And I'll, I'll, I'll try and <laughs> yeah, get you. Get to, back your, I'll get you your to, uh, championship. I'll get you to push the trophy to the other side of the table. <laughs> I think it's such a cute image. Well, us just pushing this trophy back, back and, and forth. forth. Well, you're the, the one other. that usually wins. I Not lose. now. You're the reigning <laughs> champion now. Well, for a day. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Mommy, I love you very much, and uh, I'm so grateful that you're here and we're spending this time together. And we're getting better at this Scrabble game. We (laughs) are. I love you, Mommy. Love you, too. Okay, shalom, amigos y amigas. Hooray for humanity. Tom Rhodes, you're a funny man. Tom Rhodes, you're an international comedian. Tom Rhodes, karate kick, baby, oh, yeah. Dude, you go all around the world telling jokes to all of the people. You are an international comedian. You're funny to everybody in every single country in the world. Tom Rhodes, I like you very much. I think you're talented and very wonderful. Best guy in the world. I wanna be your friend. You should call me sometime. Here is my phone number 603-644-0048. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom Rhodes. You're an international comedic sensation. Tom Rhodes. I like to listen to your podcast. Tom Rhodes. You're the best man to ever walk on the earth.